Being as we're a woke channel, apparently. Yeah. We often get into the weeds where other channels fear to tread, and today is going to be one of those videos. I know, I know, we're going to be talking about how machine learning, or what the rest of the media likes to breathlessly call AI, is potentially putting people's lives at risk. Because I'm sure that's going to get us clicks. No. Okay. But since we're supported by Patreon viewers like you, we can boldly go where no channel has gone before. And today we're going to look at advanced driver assistance systems and how the implicit biases of the teams developing them may have caused some massive issues with pedestrian detection. Before we get started today, I want to be clear. We reached out to Uber, Waymo, Motional, Cruise, Ford, Tesla, and Comma.ai before publishing this. At the time of filming this, we've had a response from a very round number of companies, zero. It's no secret that most automakers are involved in some kind of run towards either semi or fully autonomous driving, and on the pathway to that sunlit upland, they're mostly passing through levels of driver assistance. We're not going to rehash the whole SAE 5 levels of driver assistance right here and right now, because we covered that here? Or yes, here. But for those of you wanting the TLDR, they range from you driving all the time, with the car just making sure you're not going to hit the person in front, through to a vehicle that can go and do your errands for you while you get an extra lion on Saturday morning. I mean, someone, or I guess something, will still need to put the chicken feed in the car at the other end, but you don't need to be there except to unload it. And this Holy Grail, while not protected by a fearsome rabbit with pointy teeth, has proven somewhat more of a challenge than optimistic predictions from automakers have led us to believe over the years. In fact, while some less careful outlets will have you believe that fully autonomous cars are here and ready for you to drive today, that's really wishful thinking. In the interim then, we have driver assistance packages of various levels, from lane keep assist systems that vaguely inform you that you've crossed the lane line about the same time you enter the delta quadrant, to systems that rigidly enforce being in the exact centre of the lane at any given moment, regardless of all else. And at the far other end of the scale, there's systems like Tesla's FSD Beta and Comma.ai, which, in the right circumstances, appear to be capable of driving without intervention. However, they definitely need oversight. The vast majority of these systems are partially or entirely based on machine learning. That is, they're given many pictures of, say, a road sign, and eventually the machine learning algorithm learns of what a road sign is, or a dustbin, or a traffic light. It learns what they look like from the side, from the front, at an angle, in the dark, when it's sunny. If you're interested about this, and indeed things like attacks on machine learning vision systems, we have a video about it. It is here. Now, the thing about most of these systems is that they're trained using images in training databases. There are massive collections of images, tens or hundreds of thousands of images. These images are labelled either by humans or by computers. So you take a picture of a road, and then you mark the things on it that are signs. Trees, traffic lights, curbs, lane markings, and of course, people. People being an important category of things you don't want to hit. Rinse and repeat thousands of times. And recently, a 2019 study hit their headlines again most likely because other similar problems have been revealed in multiple areas of machine learning. So we thought it was a great opportunity to review it. It's actually been cited by nearly 200 research papers since it originally came out. That suggests that there's the possibility that the biases we humans have may be being transferred from us to the machine's learning because the data we teach machine learning systems has its origin in human society. 
Now, being as we're woke and all, I want to address this. We all have biases. I see a press release that leans heavily on the word electrified, particularly from certain automakers who will remain nameless, and my biases tell me that it's going to be bovine byproduct. I hear words coming out of Tucker Carlson's mouth, and my biases tell me that it's going to be an awful lot of farage. All of that is useful and born of experience, but many biases are not based in fact and can be actively harmful. I am, for those who don't know, a nurse, and I'm well aware that healthcare in general by default doesn't address pain reported by both women and by black people as well as it does white men. There is a bunch of evidence that endlessly proves that, so I work to overcome that internal bias and bear that in mind when I'm assessing patients and delivering care. Sorry, I, I just need to pause here. There's a... There's a disturbance in the force. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, that was someone unsubscribing. But for those of you who want what I say to be backed up by data, here you go. Or, or here. Or here. I can actually keep this one up all day. Meanwhile, this paper suggests that because of biases inherent in the training data used for teaching driver assistance systems, as well as semi and autonomous driving systems, these systems are less good at identifying black people. This means that particularly for vision-based emergency and autonomous systems in vehicles, there may be a much increased probability of that vehicle hitting a person of colour, and while at the moment that risk might be minimised by the presence of a human behind the wheel, or I suppose a yoke if you must, we're already seeing completely autonomous vehicles out there, albeit in geofenced regions, and those cars have no driver to act as that final neutromatic machine. Now this paper does come with some caveats, and I think that it's important to understand them. Undoubtedly the biggest of those is that while this paper does use training data that is likely used for actual autonomous vehicle training, companies engaged in machine learning are, shall we say, reticent to release the data they use to train their vehicles. So we don't know for sure that this data was used, and I'll come to why I personally don't think that matters in a second. The second biggie is that no autonomous vehicle manufacturers or research programs were willing to hand over their systems to be tested. So this research project was based on FASTA and Mask RCNN, which are quote, state of the art object detection systems which often form the backbone of modern computer vision systems. And while they themselves may or may not form part of a driver assistance system, similar approaches are used broadly in the industry. Okay, so major caveats over and done with. Let's talk about how they tested. The first step was to take the training data for people from a large data set. That data in this case comes with information defining a bounding box of where a person is believed to be in the image. They then trimmed the image to the size of the bounding box, and if it had enough pixels to be reasonable to assess skin tone, they define a minimum size. It was then passed for labelling based on the Fitzpatrick skin tone. The skin tone scale is on screen right now. They split the six levels into light skinned, dark skinned, and unknown. They also had a not a person option, because these datasets are rarely great quality. Each image was assessed by three people and a comparison made to ensure that there was consistency in the labelling. While some folks were part of the research team, Mechanical Turk, that is outsourcing labelling to usually folks in lower wage countries, did the bulk of the work. And the result of those labours was 3,513 images for training and just shy of 500 for validation. As has been seen with large datasets like this before, nearly 80% of the images were for light-skinned people. And as anyone who's familiar with the tech industry's homogenous team hits can tell you, this is an ongoing problem. Take the infamous Amazon AI system that didn't want to hire black people or women. Uh, then there was a study showing that training a natural language algorithm on internet data produced bias against women and black Americans which went very nicely with Microsoft's chatbot Tay, which very rapidly became a white supremacist. 
Another study showed that you can dress 18th century face shape pseudoscience up in machine language clothing, and it kind of does exactly what it did back then. And of course, there's the racist soap dispensers, faucets, and hand dryers that only work with pale skin. So for those of you playing along at home, yeah, you're spot on. Using the average precision 75 metric, which is basically a way of requiring the machine to spit out results at a particular level of certainty, there was a stark difference between the ability of the machine learning system to identify dark-skinned and light-skinned people. In this case, it was a shift from 67.1% for identifying light-skinned people to 55.9% for darker-skinned people. That's a drop of more than 10 percentage points. Even at lower levels of certainty, that difference remained, although it did get smaller. That 10% though is more than sufficient to be the difference between successfully categorizing a person as, well, a person and avoiding them, or as in the case of Elaine Hertzberg and the Uber involved in the autonomous testing program there, running them over and killing them. And it also leaves open the question of if this can't successfully identify people of colour, how good is it at identifying children? How about people in wheelchairs or using other assistive devices? Okay, so why does this happen? And what can we do about it? Or demand that the government automakers and autonomous vehicle companies do about it? Well, the study's authors make some effort to examine possible confounding factors. Lighting. Maybe all the dark-skinned people happened to be shot on dark grey days. Whether all the dark-skinned people in the dataset just happened to be more occluded either by other people or objects than light-skinned people. Neither of those were found to be responsible for the inequity. It's most likely that the problem stems from two issues. One is that there just isn't enough training data in the set for dark-skinned people. The model sees 3.5 times as many light-skinned people to learn what a person is as it does a dark-skinned person. That gives it less information to produce a general model of what characteristics define a person for darker-skinned people, making it less likely to be able to apply those rules that say, yes, this is a person, in different scenarios. This is actually something that we've seen in research looking at children and their perception of the world. Also, these models kind of weight their, quote, knowledge based on the training data they receive. They're tested against data that's probably got the same inequality in it, and so if they get things wrong for dark-skinned people more often, but only encounter a tiny proportion of dark-skinned people in testing, then problems with that model aren't going to show up. So what to do? Well, one is to make sure that the algorithms are trained on more carefully obtained data, to make sure that the data is well labelled and the models are built to appropriately weight that data. The old adage of garbage in, garbage out still holds true. Another thing that we desperately need is legislation that requires testing of driver models and some degree of openness and clarity about how these models are being tested. Proprietary should not be an acceptable defence for killing people. And I'm going to be blunt here. Another fix is to have teams that are more diverse. If you have a homogenous team, then it's much more likely you'll miss something and overlook a problem that will be significant to a minority population. And then you end up with a soap dispenser that doesn't work for black people, or a car that's more likely to run over people of colour. It's that simple. And on that note, we're done with today's video. Thank you for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do, and feel free to let us know your thoughts in our Discord chat room by reaching out to us on Mastodon, or if you're a Patreon supporter, leaving a comment on our Patreon page. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin, and Swag store as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling by on my right is our amazing list of Charged Up supporters, and shoutouts go to our self-driving tier supporters Mike Weeder, Denny Hyde, Linda Irish, Lance Schaal, Mark Eggleton, Cyprian Laplace, John Trammell, Alan Tupper, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Sean Tucker, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Kyle Hodgson, Tony Moss, Brophy Wolf, Kyle Fox, Hey Esker, Tesla in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen Frembergen, I think I've mispronounced that, so please let us know, Stephen Williams, Regine Fellows, Chris Centre, and Jim Burness. 
And finally, out of this world, thanks to our top tier supporters, John L. Henderson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, John Lyons, Kevin Burrowbridge, Andrew Glenn, Joe Hughes, Dave Kitchen, Joe Bresney, Nigel S, Matthew Drobnak, Eric Knack, Paul Conway, Stephen O'Donoghue, JP Fagerback, Reggie Watts, Marcel Ward, Robert Flannery, Aaron Han, Rory Litwin, Ellery Hensley, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on the main channel, plus Sunday on Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon, and as always, keep evolving!